Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Enterprise Cloud Security Summit. Today's event was organized by the hardworking folks at Virtualization and Cloud Review and Redmond Magazine, who have brought together some of the best independent experts on today's topic. Many thanks to our sponsor, Rubrik, the Zero Trust Data Management Company, for making this event possible. And thanks to you for joining us. I'm John K. Waters, Editor-in-Chief of Application Development Trends, and I'll be your moderator for the first of three information-packed sessions. But before we get started, I need to go over a few housekeeping details. Each of today's sessions is being recorded for later access. Keep an eye out for an email with a link to that recording. It'll be coming your way within the next few days. Each of today's sessions will be followed by a five to 10 minute Q&A. You can type your questions into the Q&A box at any time. Please feel free to add your questions as they occur to you throughout the summit. We'll do our best to get to all of them. Our sponsor, Rubric, has provided some extra resources that can be found on the right-hand side of your screen. Please take a moment to check those out. And last but not least, at the end of the third session, one lucky attendee will be receiving a Surface Pro 7, Microsoft's ultralight tablet. But you must be present to win, so stick with us. Now let's get to our first session, Enterprise Cloud Setup and Configuration Best Practices. Our presenter today is Sergey Chubarov. Sergey is a team leader and sought after speaker with a long list of credentials. He's a Microsoft MVP, a cloud architecture and security trainer, an offensive security certified professional, an offensive security experience pen tester, an MCT regional lead, an EC council instructor, and a Microsoft certified <laughs> trainer. Needless to say, we are in for an informative, yeah, pardon me, an, inf an informative and information packed session. Take it away, Sergey. Thanks, John. Thanks for a great introduction, and let's get started. So uh, you left me on the slide with my picture, and I hope other people can see my videos so you can compare if they are the similar. Um, so, yeah, just a different hairstyle. Uh, so, yeah, thank you very much. Um, my name is Sergey, and I don't want to say a lot about myself just because John uh, made a really good introduction. I just want to say a few things. Uh, I work with different clouds. Uh, most of the time, and I'm most experienced I with, with Microsoft Azure and AWS, uh, my Amazon AWS. So uh, I'm going to operate those clouds when, when I'm going to discuss security. Of course, uh, we have much, much more in the real world. So we have GCP and some other uh, vendors, but I'm going to use those uh, top two clouds for examples, but it doesn't mean that you cannot use the same similar approach for um, in case of other, other clouds. Uh, all right, so what are we going to cover today? Um, we, we're going to talk about uh, uh, cloud security, and I think you, you know that usually our first session is like one-on-one -on -one session when, we, when we're talking about some basic things. So what I want to do with you here, first I'm going to talk about cloud security challenges. Why cloud is like, it's not the same approach that we had on-premises, and what, what's the prob what, what problems we may have with, cl with cloud security. Uh, next step is going to talk about identity and access management. Uh, after this, I'm going to cover cloud assessment and how can we remediate uh, some problems we have in our cloud configuration. And the last one, but not least, uh, security operations monitoring, because it's not, 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 not just enough to uh, configure uh, our security, then we should monitor and constantly check if we are still um, if we are still compliant and without, and if our configuration is still compliant with our uh, our requirements, um, and this session mostly will be based on live demos. I'm going to show you a few slides uh, in the first in the first part. Then I'm going to jump to demo and show you many many demos from um, using Azure and AWS as well. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead. We're going to we're going to handle your questions in the end of the session. Uh, all right, so let's get started. Uh, I'm going to first uh, talk about cloud security challenges. Um, after this, I'm going to jump to demo as well. Uh, so um, first, uh, when we start to use cloud, and I think not, nowadays it's, it is not something new for you, but maybe when we just start to embrace the cloud nine, ten years ago, uh, that was something um, not really common. And, um, you know, 
those cloud vendors, uh, com cloud companies, they told us that we have the best security. So if you move your, your workloads to our data centers, then you will be protected much better. And so uh, is it true or not? Uh, first of all, yes, their, they, their data centers, their, their infrastructure is much better protected that we can afford because they spend billions of dollars to uh, make their data centers um, the most secure in the world. Um, and they, and, and they, have, and, and they are, are under attack every day. So AWS or uh, Azure or any other cloud providers, they have so much experience because um, attackers from all over the world, they attack their companies every day. And so they know how to handle a number of those attacks. And so they have very nice experience with that. And of course, people that work for them, they have a number of very great ex experts. Uh, at the same time, we have a very interesting thing called shared responsibility. So uh, you must know, I think you know that because now it's not, it's not something new for, for many, but uh, 10 years ago, even five years ago, many people did not understand that uh, if they move their workloads to the cloud, it doesn't mean that AWS or Microsoft or what or Amazon or, or Microsoft will completely, completely manage security for you. So um, we have shared responsibility between provider and the customer. So you as a customer and provider uh, as well provider, you share responsibility. And so uh, part of the uh, part of the part of the responsibility on your side, and you must configure security from your from from your perspective. Uh, let me show you uh, two slides about sh shared responsibility models. So this one from AWS, um, and this one from Microsoft Azure. Uh, they are quite similar, um, and let me just use this example uh, in Microsoft Azure. So you can see here, based on cloud mo cloud model, uh, we have uh, more or less responsibility. So for example, if we use IaaS, it's like virtual machines then we must be responsible for operating system, network, network controls, applications we install on top of the virtual machine, um, and, and so on. But if, if we move to SaaS, then we don't need to be responsible for operating system or applications, but we are, we're still responsible for our accounts, like username and password. We're still responsible for data we place there. We're still responsible for our devices we use to connect to, to, to that cloud. So even if you, if, if, you, if you have cloud environment, if you have cl uh, cloud subscription, um, IaaS, PaaS, SaaS, whatever, you're still responsible for some portion of, um, some portion of things. So that's super important, super, super important con concept. So you are responsible. And here we have confusion because uh, when you want to configure your part of work, when you want to configure your, your part of security, uh, you face with a huge number of cloud services. So we have virtual machines, databases, uh, that just well-known services, but so many of them. So we have, I don't know how many to be, to be fair, um, thousands, few thousands, number of thousands, I don't know. So, so many cloud services. If you open AWS console or um, Azure portal, you will see so many services. Uh, also, we have a number of security features. For every service, we have some sort of security configurations. We have security service in general, like like you know, separate service for to to that provides the security, and all of this is growing, 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 and that may confuse a lot. Also, by the way, existing things that uh, existing features here you have configured, they may they are changing as well. So, for example, uh, you configure something, and then protocols were deprecated. Well, protocol was deprecated, and so you need to reconfigure it again. Uh, so that may be quite confusing because you have so many things to configure, and you may not know wh where to start, where to start, um, what to do next, and so on. So that's the primary problem we have in the cloud. Cloud, yeah, it's very good from security standpoint as well. At the same time, we have too much, uh, too much, too many features there, too much data, and so it's hard to deal with all of this. All right, so that's not, that's that's the problem. That's that's the problem. Now, where should we start if we if we decide to start to configure security in our cloud? What should we do first? If you remember, oh, by the way, let me let me go back 
Uh, and you can see here in shared responsibility that you are responsible for accounts. So you're responsible for your username, you're responsible for your password, you're responsible for your, de for your device. And so you should start with, uh, with identity and access management. So you should configure accounts properly so attackers will not be able to brute force um, or use some sort of passwords, what, what, password that you may, you may lose um, or publish on that on GitHub also very well-known case. So let's start from identity and access. So I am identity access management comes first. Uh, and one of the first thing you can do, uh, you may protect and lock your root account. That's for AWS specifically. So you may protect your AWS root account that you, sh you, 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 you used to, you know, um, to start it, when, when you can, when you when you register in AWS, when you sign up, you you will use your account, your 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 email address will become your root account. So, quite nice idea is to have uh, is to change the password for this account for crazy long password. Um, also, you may uh, disable this account at all, and so this account will not be used will not be used. So, much better is to create new new users um, in AWS directory. So, new new users there and use those users. And so have your root account only in case of any problems, but don't just leave this account because that's your public email. So maybe this public email will be known by somebody else and people will try to brute force that, uh, or maybe you reuse this, this email. And so people will try to, um, you know, restore password if they compromise your email account. So many ways how, what, why, when the root, a root account gives you all keys to the kingdom. So many ways to compromise your account if they own your email address, your, your, your mailbox. Uh, so root account should be disabled. Um, and you should also have crazy long password. Uh, second idea is to, by the way, in Azure, we also may have sometimes um, personal account. Uh, quite often we, we, we just create the subscription and you use uh, uh, Azure AD account right away. Uh, but sometimes you also may um, open the Azure subscription and use personal account for that. Uh, so for personal accounts, we have the same rule, um, have the strong password, uh, log them out and don't use them often. Uh, don't use them to log in. Uh, next one, uh, enable MFA for every user. That's a simple rule. But you should follow this rule. I know that even administrators, they don't really like MFA. You know, it's annoying. We need to type something else. We also must have a device with us. Um, so what if we forget our, our device at home? Uh, yes, that, that, but that, that's what, that, what users say. But when you're an administrator, please try to protect your account better. So MFA, that's a de facto standard nowadays. And, and second one, you can use some additional, fee, additional services for uh, protection. So, for example, you may you may not allow to log in from some other some countries that you don't trust, um, or you may not allow to log in from untrusted devices. So, you may add some additional protection layers. Uh, from here, let me jump to demo, and I'm going to show you some of those things on AWS and in Azure as well. Let me click uh, screen share. And you should be able to see my screen. I hope you can do that. And let me start from AWS. Oh, uh, don't you mind telling me that you can see my screen? Hey, John, can you see my screen? Hey, oh, yeah, I'm sorry about that. Yeah, right now I'm just looking at the demo slide. Um, I wonder if we could get an assist on this. Let's see. Um, huh. Uh, thanks for bearing with us, guys uh, and gals. Let's see here. I wonder if um, there's a... Um... Uh, Meller says she can see that. Um, so yeah, uh, we're, okay. Okay. Well, then we're good. We're all set, yep. guys. I can see it on the, uh, on the website. We're good to go. All right, good. So that's AWS console. Uh, all right, so you, by, by the way, I will not jump back to slides again. Uh, I will use slides now uh, in my shared, in, in my screen sharing. So I will, so we'll, I will not, you'll, we will not do it again. Um, I will continue my, my slides, my, I show, to show my slides with a shared screen. Uh, so here you can see um, AWS console. And here it says, um, security recommendations. So when you just go there, when you just go to, um, Identity access management in AWS, it will give you some recommendations. So it says, hey, 
uh, disable root user ac access keys. Um, so, and a root account should have MFA. So that's the bare minimum I have. Um, and so I follow those recommendations. To be fair, I, I did not lock out my, my personal account, my, my root account, because that's my demo environment. I don't really care about that. Uh, but uh, yeah, but it's a good idea to create new users, so create add user, and use those new users instead. So do not really use your root account, because when, when, the more often you use something, the uh, more risk you have. So please use your, create new, new user and lock out your existing uh, root account. All right, so that's the fir first recommendation. And, and by the way, when you, when you just go there, you will see it. So a root user should have MFA, yes I do. And so your root user should not have any access keys. Uh, I also don't have it. All right, so that's in my AWS. At the same time, if I go to, 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 to Azure, I'm going to see here uh, users. I don't have uh, a root user here at all. So all the users here, they are in Azure AD as well. All right, so uh, first first of all, disable the initial account that you're, gonna t you're going to use to create your subscription. Uh, next one. Um, next one, uh, you may enable multi-factor authentication. You should enable multi-factor authentication. How can you do that? Uh, let's do it in, in Azure, similar approach we have in AWS. Uh, I can enable MFA per user. So if I, if I click here on this button, per user MFA, um, I'm gonna see the list of my users and let me find a user. Let, let's, let's try to find John Doe. And here I have this user. I have two users to be fair with John with the name John Da. I can check the box and say enable MFA against this user, and so MFA will be enabled. Uh, to be fair, it's maybe not, not the not the most convenient way to enable MFA uh, in Azure, but in general, uh, you should have MFA for at least for your administrators, much better, but even better for all of the users, all the users in your company. And so in, uh, in Azure, what you can do, uh, you can do it even more interesting. You can go to security uh, and you can find here conditional access. And with conditional access, you may create a policy. So policy will enforce MFA or do some other things based on your conditions. So you can say, all right, uh, let me first specify condition, uh, sorry, uh, the action. So I want to require MFA. So require MFA. Uh, then I'm, I'm gonna say for, 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 for whom, for which user? I can say for all users or for specific users. Um, or users with specific, with specific permissions. Let me choose John Doe user. Now let me click select. Um, and when user John Doe logs in to my cloud applications, to specific or to all applications, what I wanna do, I want to require MFA. At the same time, I can add some extra conditions. I can say, for example, if my user uh, John Doe logs in from Android, in this case, uh, he will be required to, to represent the second factor. But if, if, if John Doe logs in from any other type of devices, uh, he will not be asked for MFA. So that's, that's flexible. So it doesn't mean that you should do that, do it, but that's flexible. Or I can do some, something else. I can say, um, I want to um, ask M for MFA only when user logs in from UK, so from, from a specific country. Or, or vice versa, I can say for something different. I can say, let's say we block access when a uh, user uh, logs in from UK. Uh, that's flexible, or, or, or we, can, we can do it even, even more interesting. We can exclude UK, and so in this case, all locations will be blocked except UK, and so you can log in only from UK. Uh, so you may use those additional services um, to make uh, your identity and access management, you may, you may make your configuration even more, even better. Uh, so that's in a nutshell, identity and access management. So that's the very, very basic things you should implement. Maybe you, maybe you will not be able to use conditional access in AWS, for example, but at least you may uh, enable MFA. Um, and so MFA is available everywhere in, in, in AWS, GCP, Azure, everywhere. 
Uh, if you want to have conditional access, but you are using the AWS, I'm going to tell you how can you do it, um, but later, slightly later. Um, all right, so let me go back to slides. This time, I'm not going to uh, use slides in the system. I'm going to just use my shared screen, and I, I'm going to continue uh, where, where I left off. So um, I was there. Next. After, after we configure our account, so we have um, our administrator, administrator account. By the way, I have no idea why um, I have the resolution like this. Uh, so um, when, I, when, I, when, I configured, uh, when I when I configured my accounts, uh, next step, I want to assess my cloud resources. So in general, if we're talking about cloud security, that's the that's a very long journey. We need uh, so we, we need a few days to explain you different cloud security aspects, uh, but if you want to just pack that into into something short, the best recommendation I can, I can give you is to use cloud cloud security assessment that built into the platform. Let me show you this. So uh, in the cloud platform, we have built in cloud security assessment. So you can assess your your uh, your resources that you deploy in, in the cloud. Also, you may assess. Um, operating system, operating system. So, for example, if you deploy virtual machines, you may look into virtual machine and find out vulnerabilities because we have built-in VA solution, uh, and that assessment will give you some ideas where should you start and what should you fix first. Because uh, quite often, when you have a report with number of things you should fix, you don't know. Or, uh, all right, where should we start? Should we do that? Because we need a few months to fix all of this, or even even even, even longer. So where to start? Where should we start? And that will give you some priorities. Uh, what should you fix first and what, where sh what should you do next? Uh, by the way, this cloud assessment may give you also some ideas about identity access, but that... um, so you will see that recommendations as well. And they will, be the, they will have the highest priority. And what is interesting, this cloud assessment also may support uh, multi-cloud. So if you have multiple clouds, so let's say you have um, Azure, AWS, GCP, and you want to see it on a single pane of glass, in this case, uh, multi-cloud may be supported in, uh, uh, on, on, the, on the single page. All right, let, let's see that. Let me jump back to demo. Uh, let me jump back to demo. And here, first of all, I'm going to show you AWS, as usual. So in AWS, we have a service called Security Hub. Security Hub. Come on. All right. So, um, and so it says it says my score here it's sixty three. So uh, that score, generally speaking, that score it, it, uh, that was that that was eval that was evaluation based on different security standards. So AWS Financial Security Best Practices, that's from, from Amazon. CIS, that's a well-known thing, I think you know what it is. Uh, PCI DSS, so um, in CI, according to CIS, my score is very low. So let's, let's go and, and click in Insights. Um, let's wait. So <laughs> AWS resource with the most findings. Let me try to click here. And here are my IRN, some Amazon resource numbers. I know it, it doesn't say anything about, uh, doesn't say anything to you, but you can see here. So here's the IRN. Um, and here is a number of findings about this, uh, about this resource. So here is, by the way, bucket, uh, S3 bucket, and also those two are buckets, and they have eight findings. Let me click on bucket. By the way, uh, CENTCOM, uh, that's, that's funny thing. Um, if you just Google about Sencom, you will find <laughs> what, what it is. Uh, that was a very famous case with AWS and Pentagon. Um, so you might find here findings about my S3 buckets. So S3 buckets should, should prohibit public access, read, uh, uh, public read access. Uh, S3 buckets should prohibit public read access again. Um, so according to PCI DSS and some other recommendations. Um, so you can see here a number of recommendations. All right, let me go just to findings and see all of those recommendations. 
Um, all right. And if I click integrations, um, so I can integrate that with some other services, uh, with some other cloud services, and so enrich my data. Uh, so that's that's AWS Security Hub. Let me see the similar service in Azure. I'm gonna jump back to to to, to here and click uh, Security Center. It's called Security it's called Security Center in Azure, and that Security Center should tell me similar things. Come on, oh here we go. Um, so here I can see Secure Score, and if I click there. I can also see my score. This score is a bit lower than in, in AWS, um, and, but I have number of subscriptions, and so it depends on, it depends on subscription. Um, but my overall score is not very high. Uh, that, that's fine, that's my demo subscriptions, but in general. Let me click the subscription with, a, with, with this score, this, this subscription, and now I can see a number of recommendations. And you can see here, the, the really first recommendation is to enable MFA. So that's, that's super important. Enable MFA and in general, protect your accounts. That's, that's, that's important because you're always responsible for your accounts. Uh, now, next recommendation, secure management port. Uh, so quite good idea to protect management ports you have on your virtual machines and so on. So what I, wanna, what, what I don't wanna do here, I don't wanna read all of this because you can do it yourself and you can see the priorities. They are sorted by the max score. So max score potentially means that this one is the more prioritized and you should, should focus on, the, on this one more. So you should start from, from top to the bottom. Uh, so uh, in AWS, in Azure, we have service that will assess your, your resources and, and, and they're gonna tell you what should you do with those with those services to, to protect them better. But yeah, yeah, of course, I can, I can tell you the same things, uh, but I must spend a few hours to tell you about all of this. But instead, I can just sh show you this cloud assessment tool, and you then you, you will review all of this yourself. So please go ahead and check your security center or security hub, depending on cl which cloud you're going to use. Uh, and that should tell you what should you fix in your resources. By the way, also, should, what should you keep in mind? Uh, those scores in AWS or Azure, they are not static. So if you fix everything and you have even 100%, it doesn't mean that you will have the same, this score forever because you deploy new resources. Um, cloud providers, they create the new, um, you know, the new recommendations, new controls here, like, like they, call, they call here. Um, and so that will um, decrease your score. They, they will... Um, uh, uh, they will add some more more recommendations and that will drop your score score down all right hope it makes sense let me go back to to to, to um, my security center and show you some other things like I told you about VA so let me go back here um, and here um, we I, I showed you like a built-in assessment and prioritize remediation how about VA so um, VA also may be built in and let me just go to, 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 to Azure Defender here and look at this. So uh, I have four, 20, uh, 24 virtual machines not protected with VA solution. Uh, to be fair, that's my over, overall number of, of virtual machines. Um, and one container, which is also not protected. Um, all right, let's try to check that. Let me click here. Um, and I can see all of my virtual machines. Uh, and look at this. So there's a virtual machine, especially for this demo, that I called Qualys. What I can do, I can check the box and say, I want to fix the, uh, I want to fix this problem. And so what I want to do, I want to deploy, I want to deploy a VA solution to this virtual machine. Of course, you will not see immediate actions because it takes takes some time before agent will be deployed, and then the, it will evaluate the virtual machine. Take some time, uh, but just believe me, that's VA solution. I think you heard about Qualys. That's the quite well known solution for for vulnerability assessment. And so, what will happen if if I do it? Um, virtual machine will send the data to Qualys data center, and Qualys will evalu evaluate all of this and give recommendations and turn it back to uh, turn it back to Azure. Um, so, and the similar thing I can do for containers. Let me just jump back to containers, and look at this. So, I have container registry. Um, so, in my registry, I have container uh, container image. Sorry, um, and so here it tells me some recommendations. Uh, so my container image is based on Ubuntu 16.04, which is outdated. 
So the first recommendation, and, and really critical recommendation, is to don't use this image at all because that's 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 the old operating system. But also I can add, I can see some other recommendations as well. So that's the VA solution part part with by Qualys uh, for container images, and the same the same thing we have for virtual machines as well. So we can see here uh, VA solution may be built into that assessment as well. And what about multi cloud? Um, so if I go down below, I can see here cloud connectors. So what I can do, I can connect from, from here, from this Azure portal to some other providers for his, here's AWS. Um, so I connected to AWS only, not, 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 I don't have GCP connectivity. And if I go to secure score back, um, click here. And where is that? Uh, let me just say uh, resource type. Nope, no, environment, environment, AWS. And here, here are recommendations I have from AWS. Yeah, that is the same recommendations you may find in Security Hub. You, so we take all of this from AWS. But at the same time, if you use, if you use, if you use multiple clouds, you may try to see all of this on the single pane of glass. Um, and so those recommendations you may find from AWS, you may find in Azure. Um, all right, so let me jump back to slides. Um, and the last but not least, last but not least, um, uh, is security monitoring. So that's nice to uh, configure your security and follow the, those assessment recommendations. But at the same time, uh, nothing can be static in your in the cloud. As we, as, as we mentioned before, as I mentioned before, uh, cloud um, is dynamic. It, 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 uh, it, so they deploy new changes, they deploy new, new services, changes every day. So something is, uh, is changing in the cloud every day. So, uh, and also in, in your resources, something may, something, something may, may change there. So what you should do, you should also have, you should have constant feedback about your configurations and about your resources. So that will allow you to uh, keep your security posture on the high level or improve that if it drops down. If, if it drops, you, can, you may improve that uh, right away so you don't need to wait for a long time before you realize, oh, something that was not configured properly. Um, so you should use monitoring. Also with monitoring, you can detect threats. So maybe, maybe our machine was compromised, who knows? I hope not, not but, or maybe our storage that we have, uh, someone upload malware to it. Uh, different things may, ha may happen. So we can detect threats as soon as possible. Um, and so we can take action uh, even before that, 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 that uh, even, even before that affect your customer environment. So for example, um, so when we monitor our, one of our, our customers, we found uh, that uh, virtual machines start start to um, generate outgoing traffic on the port six 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 six, which is well known Metasploit port. You know, not only Met Metasploit, but usually all of those frameworks for their shells they use those port like four 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 five 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 six 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 six. And so we found that even before uh, attackers did something something bad, and so we just block it right away, and then. I start to investigate, uh, and after this, we start investigation. So uh, when you detect first, and then you you may investigate, and even if if you want to find the root cause, you may hunt for that th for that threat. So let me jump back to demo, and let's do it real quick. So as usual, let me start from AWS. Uh, in AWS, we have number of services, and um, we have like well known classic services. Um, uh, first one called CloudTrail. Come on. Uh, so with CloudTrail, we can find, let me just, so event history. So in CloudTrail, we can see all those API calls. So we can see console login, so put evaluations. Uh, I can see what, what, what happened there. Um, that will not tell me about my resources, but that will tell me about API calls. Uh, but if I use CloudWatch, I'm not sure the CloudWatch was configured, but let me check. Yeah, I think that. 
So EC2, something insufficient data. Uh, something was configured, so it's configured and it shows me some information like about CPU utilization, but uh, not configured completely. But, but here I can see logs, metrics, and what's going on with my assets. Uh, so that, that's just a basic monitoring. Let me jump back to Azure. And from here, uh, I also have service called Monitor. And uh, that's the like one-stop shop for uh, all of the basic monitoring in, 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 my, in my tenant. So here I can see Activity Log, which is like similar to CloudTrail. Um, I can see the metrics here. Um, so I can see metrics. Um, and so based on those metrics, I can evaluate what's going on with my, with my resource. Let me take, for example, virtual machine. Uh, uh, so virtual machines. And let me take, 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 take. I'll just find out what is. Yeah, better. So let me apply that. And so here, let me monitor percentage of CPU. And so that 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 that, that, that was shown. Uh, so that's that's the basic monitor. And of course, we always should monitor not only because of security reasons, but always we should monitor to analyze performance, uh, to analyze some bottlenecks. Um, and here also may, you may find security things counters as well. Uh, but also it would be a nice idea to have some sort of SOC environment, I mean, to security operation center, uh, where you can have, collect all of those logs all together. Uh, and analyze them centrally. So for these purposes, we have the service. We have the service. Um, as of, co of course, you, you may use different services for that. You may use Splunk um, or whatever you you want. But if we're, we're talking about Azure here, uh, so that service called Sentinel. Let me just log in back. Um, by the way, that's that's not a way. How can you log in without any passwords? Um, and so uh, service I want to show you called Sentinel. Um, so Sentinel, uh, that's, that's, that's specifically for security monitoring. And what I can do with this Sentinel, I can collect information from so many different sources. So I can take information from, uh, from, from my AWS. I can take information from my Apache, from my, from my Azure. Um, let's say if I have GCP, oh, it's Google. Uh, so in Google Workspace, there's no GCP really. Um, I think it, it's there, maybe some fancy names. Uh, so so many connectors here. So I connect the, I, I connect to the cloud cloud provider. I can cl cloud the resource, and that will start to gather data from that sources. So for example, if I take data from AWS, uh, then I can hear. I look, look at this. So this number of data I got, uh, and so based on this. I can then create rules and detect some some weird weird things. So, for example, let me find the rule templates and let's find AWS or related to AWS. Let's say a rule data source is AWS connector. Click OK, and so here's the number of um, rules I can use in AWS uh, according to the AWS connector. So, failed AWS console log logons, but successful Azure. So, so here's the rule. When you log into AWS at the same time, in the, in the, the same user. So, so you try to log into AWS uh, and it was failed. At the same time, the same user tried to log into Azure and that was successful. And of course, in a period of five few minutes, I don't know when it checked the rule within the same time frame. Um, and so we have vice versa. So Azure, you'll try to log into fail to log in log into Azure AD, but successful log into AWS. Uh, and number of rules to detect. And when we have those rules, uh, we may we may just have the an incident about this, um, and we can even run some automated automated response. So, for example, we can just block access for this user, so we can disable the user at all, um, or inform user that they need to change their password, whatever. So we can change we, we can create our automation, or we can create our response, and that will be automated. Of course, we need all of the we we'll need all we we need we all need to. We need to plan that, and it's not just some simple template that we may just click a few times. Uh, and the implementation of Security Operation Center, that's the long journey. Uh, but for large companies or for, or for uh, providers, that's, that's quite, 
that's a very nice idea. Um, all right, so that's few things I want to. It looks like it's it, uh, for for me. It's time to wrap up the session. So I'm gonna finish my demo soon. Uh, all right, I promise you to tell you how we can integrate. Um, so what if I want to uh, use some sort of conditional access, which is the feature of Azure AD? What if I want to use that in AWS? So what if I want to log into AWS and have uh, Azure AD features there? How can we do it? So yes, that, that's possible if you go to Azure AD applications um, and create new application. Uh, and here you may find even templates, so like AWS, GCP. So that's going to be integration between uh, those cloud providers. And so you can log in with credentials, with Azure AD credentials to AWS uh, or GCP, Oracle, SAP, whatever. So many, many applications. I have, I have integration configured for, I think, Salesforce. Let me double check that. Come on. Uh, let's double check. Uh, yes, I do. Salesforce. So let me so, so look. Look at this. I, I just logged in to Azure. Let me click on Salesforce icon here. And come on. Should work. Uh, that that takes a bit longer because I have some extra policies. But anyway, now I look look at this. I logged into Salesforce. I did not uh, put any username and password. And what is interesting here, if I click download uh, file, it says, "Hey, download was blocked," and that was by Microsoft. So that's the, Microsoft one of the security services. I, I don't want to cover it here, but just an idea that that was blocked by Microsoft. I'm in sales Salesforce, but. Um, Microsoft doesn't allow me to download documents from Salesforce. Um, so that's quite quite an interesting thing that we can integrate some multiple cloud together and have the best from 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 all of those from each of them of those clouds. And finally, before I jump to QA, I want to show you one thing. Um, may, maybe you saw that I'm, I'm Microsoft MVP and so um, um, a few days ago I got a certificate that you know the certificate that um, I'm MVP, I mean, the new certificate because we have extension each, each year, renewal each year. And so I gave my old certificate to my son. And so look what I got, what, what I found today. Um, I, I, I guess that's the truck and that's maybe son, whatever. Um, all right. So now um, I'm going to finish with my demo. Let me jump to the slide where we have Q&A. Um, and let me stop my screen sharing. You should be able to, 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 to see the slide again soon. And now it's time for your questions. If you have any of those, if any questions, go ahead and ask them. But before, uh, So I'm going to wrap up my session. Um, and uh, you may start to type your question. So in this. In this session, in, in the last four, four, four minutes, what, what, uh, or 45 minutes, um, so what, what, what we discuss here is that what should you do when you just start to work with cloud? So first of all, don't forget, you must protect your account because that's, that's the thing that allow you to log in and account will give the attacker or you, or you or attacker all keys to the kingdom. So you should protect your account pretty well. After this, you should do a lot but the best thing we, we can, I can tell you here in, in, in these 40 minutes is to run cloud assessment. It will tell you, it will give you many recommendations and give you also priorities. So just go ahead and check recommendations from Security Hub in AWS or Security Center in Azure or whatever your cl cloud you have uh, and follow their recommendations. And finally, don't forget to constantly monitor what's going on with your, with your assets because nothing static and cloud is constantly changing. Um, and we have new features uh, or we have changes um, in the cloud every day. Uh, make sure that you don't not forget to, 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 to keep an eye on the changes. All right, so thank you very much for uh, that you spend your time thank here. You, that was great. Oh, thanks, John. Thanks, John.
Um, yeah, thank nice you. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Hey, your, your son's a real artist. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that, <laughs> especially, especially from you. Um, especially from you. <laughs> okay, uh, now let's get some questions from our attendees. Remember, uh, guys, you can type your questions into the Q&A box at any time. We'll do our best to get to all of them. Okay, uh, we've got a question here. Um, any thoughts on using uh, the cloud as a disaster recovery option for a primary or um, on-prem network? Uh, yeah, sure. So uh, that was popular uh, a few years ago. Um, I mean, uh, you know, especially you know, in in the US, when you have those natural disasters in some 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 regions, you know, some regions here again and so on, uh, earthquakes. Um, and so, yeah, I know some companies, especially in those regions, they use that. And so they replicate their assets uh, to the cloud. But uh, nowadays, um, the approach is, a, is changing as well. So five years ago, we more use virtual machines. Uh, so we uh, deploy our applications on virtual machines and we use this IaaS. So we had virtual machines on premises and we, and we uh, synchronize those machines to the cloud, and that was yeah, disaster recovery. Nowadays, much more popular to move to PaaS, you know, to 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 the you know to platform as a service, and so all of this will be in mm -hmm. the cloud as uh, so in the cloud. So that's a, that will be a cloud service, native cloud service. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, of course, you can store, you, you can use cloud as a disaster recovery option uh, if you use virtual, you, you may you may synchronize your virtual machines to the cloud. Uh, but nowadays, uh, even more popular is to just use cloud-native services. But you may mix, of course, you may use cloud-native services and back up your virtual machines from on-prem. Sure. Okay, here's another question. Is uh, uh, Security Hub uh, free with AWS? Uh, is it free? Uh, not really free. It, I think if I remember correct, it depends on uh, which um, recommendation you're going to use. Uh, I th mm, to be fair, I don't remember that. Um, let me double check Security Hub. Oh, you can do it yourself to be fair, but um, let me just do it in parallel. Uh, security, okay. ADBS, security Hub pricing. I think it depends on the recommendation. Uh, okay. All right, well, here's one. Um, somebody's asking, where were the AWS connectors? Um, so where were the AWS connectors? So do you mean uh, um, in Azure? Sure. I mean... Yeah, uh, uh, if the attendee would like to sort of clarify that question, uh, we'll answer it. Let me move on to the next one. We've got, um, there is a choice we have, one cloud or multi-cloud, which one is better? Uh, from security perspective? Oof. Hard question, to be fair. I would mm -hmm. say, um, so on this question, uh, I don't have the, uh, the, the, the one and simple answer for you, because uh, one cloud, mm -hmm. one, from, from security pers perspective, yeah, of course, you may take the best from both clouds, from multiple clouds, um, and it, what's the, most of the time, most, most of the time, companies start with one cloud. Then they realize, oh, uh, in Azure mm -hmm. this service is better, and in Amazon and in AWS this service is better. So let me use both clouds. Let me configure VPN between them, and let's let's use both. Maybe here mm -hmm. virtual machine is less expensive. In this this month we have promo for those type of virtual machines, so we're going to use AWS here. But here we're going to use Azure. Uh, but then uh, when you start to do it, you will realize that. Uh, too many hassles because um, you must manage, maintain, and keep an eye on both both environments. You must uh, oh, at least two environments. I mean, mm. you must be an expert in AWS and you must be an expert in Azure. You must keep an eye on the changes in Azure and the changes in AWS. So from this standpoint, that's that's quite hard to to track all of this. Uh, and you may miss some uh, you know new configurations. Um, when you have multiple clouds. Mm -hmm. At the same time, um, at, at the same time, um, you may take the best from two clouds or three clouds, uh, and that will be uh, better. So you may, if you, especially if you integrate those clouds. So I would say try it yourself um, and choose what what works better for you. If if uh, if not if not, not too much efforts for you, uh, then use multiple clouds. Okay. So um, uh, the. Uh... Attendee who asked where were the AWS connectors clarified in Azure. 
Yeah, sure. That's not a big deal. So you, 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 just, you, just, you just go to, to Security Hub, uh, sorry, Security Center, um, Security Center, uh, go all the way down to the bottom, and you will find cloud connectors there. So you click cloud connectors, uh, you'll find their GCP and AWS. So, and you, and then you need to connect. You you may find an instruction um, how to how to do it. Okay, here's another one. What about data that cannot be transferred outside the company? How do you use the cloud in this case? Uh, interesting question. So, I would say that. Um, I know a few companies that are completely in the cloud, so they don't have anything on premises. They don't have anything uh, inside of their, they have just devices here, laptops. Um, um, so nothing else. Uh, and I have, and I know some companies that don't, are never, will never go to the cloud because they will never go to the cloud. At least they, they say like this. Uh, but most of the time companies, they have some mixed environments, so they, they, they have what's called hybrid. So they have some portion on premises and they have portion in the cloud and they uh, keep data they don't, don't want to publish, they keep on premises um, and then uh, the data they can go, they, they can use in the cloud, they just publish that in the cloud. Um, and I know that I, I think I'll retire uh, before all companies in the world move completely to the cloud. Uh, and not, I'm, not, I'm not that old by the way, so. <laughs> I have around 30 years before that. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, here's another question. Why are, the, uh, let's see, why are there so many different security services available? Why can't you solve all the issues with one service? Uh, um, one service. Um, you know, that, that, that's, that, that's very interesting. Yes, we have number of configuration, but at the same time, you remember, we have in general number of services. So we have Kubernetes, we have virtual machines, we have storage, we have so, so many, 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 many things. And of course, for each service, we have some individual configurations. Um, and so we cannot just, so yeah, that, that's the dream of um, many users to have one button that will do everything for them. Uh, but in fact, that's not possible. And so if we want to granularly configure something and yeah, of course, so, so um, if we use SaaS service, for example, we don't need to configure anything. We just we, we just need to protect mm -hmm. our username, password, and data. Uh, but when you ha when we have um, virtual machines, we have more granular control, and so because of this, we must configure um, all of those security aspects. Um, by the way, in parallel, I checked uh, Security Hub. No, it's not free. Sorry, you must pay for that. <laughs> okay, you know what? Uh, that's all the questions we have. Uh, and it's a good time to stop. Um, Sergey, thank you very much for uh, an excellent session, and uh, I'm, I'm sure we'll see you again soon. Hope so. So thank you very much for your <laughs> participation, and th thank you very much for your help here, your questions, your support, and hope to see you next time either. Um, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Okay, we're gonna take a short break now, but we'll be back at the top of the hour. I wanted to answer one question about the, uh, and remind everybody, somebody asked about getting a recording of the session. Each of today's sessions is being recorded for later access. So keep an eye out for an email with a link to that recording. Uh, it should be coming your way within the next few days. Okay, um, let's, so um, let's see. We're gonna take a break and our next session will be coming up at the top of the hour. It is expert best practices for securing your cloud and your data. That session will be led by Karen Lopez, senior project manager and architect at Info Advisors and moderated by my colleague, David Rammel, who leads the, the editorial team at Virtualization and Cloud Review. Uh, thanks very much to uh, Sergey Chavara for this great session and to our sponsor, Rubrik, for making it possible. Now would be a great time to check out those extra resources on your console provided by our sponsor. And remember, during the, uh, today's third session, we will be giving away a Surface Pro 7. But you must be present to win, so stay tuned. Back in a few. Okay, welcome back everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you to our speakers. And of course, our sponsor, Rubric, for underwriting this summit and allowing us to bring you this great content. I'm David Rammel, editor of Virtualization and Cloud Review, and I'm here to moderate the second session of our summit titled Expert 
best practices for securing your cloud and your data. Our speaker for this session is Karen Lopez, Senior Project Manager and Architect at Info Advisors. Karen has 20 plus years of experience in project and data management on large multi-project programs and specializes in the practical application of data management principles. She's a frequent speaker, blogger, and panelist on data quality, data governance, logical, and much more. Karen is a Microsoft SQL Server MVP, specializing in data modeling and database design. And if you're not already following her on Twitter, you can do so at at sign data chick. Karen, it's great to have you here. Please take it away. Thanks, David. That was great. Um, I also wanted to point out, I'm going to be talking later about, but I'm also a NASA data knot, which is uh, a volunteer position with working with NASA Open Data. And if we have time at the end, I've got one slide about that really interesting, fun, non-commercial project. <laughs> so in today's session, please don't wait to post your questions to the Q&A to the end. Please get them posted right away. If I see them, I might even be able to answer them. Of course, a presentation that's less than an hour isn't going to cover every single thing you need to know about best practices for uh, securing your data. Instead, I want to leave you with a bunch of principles, not nearly all you need to understand, but a bunch of principles with some examples behind them. Because if we can talk about the principles of securing the cloud and our data, and with some examples, you can use that information as you go about your day-to-day -day job, loving your data, working with it, being a member of Team Data. A lot of these things, I'll try to talk about the people, processes, and plans that need to happen if you're protecting data, as well as the performance of them, some best practices, and how not to panic. So the principles I want to talk about today are that knowing your data is loving your data, and you can't protect something that you don't love that I believe that we should work first to secure data at the data level first, and then do add other protections that exist in applications, in our infrastructure, in our network, all of those things. But I'm also going to touch on the fact that our thinking of how protection of data works has evolved over the years. So my project, my profile says I've been doing this for more than 20 years. It's actually quite a bit more than that. I just didn't want to sound overly experienced for this. Um, we're going to talk about access and authorizations, how those work hand in hand with protecting data, how to make your data tamper resistant, and that recovery is our goal for protecting data, not backups. Plus, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that we should all be talking about, sharing examples of, sharing the principles of, and I'm going to touch on some of those at the end. But why this specific topic? Well, my first statement is, as a principle, that data lasts much longer than code. So I work with data sometimes that is hundreds of years old. And you might think you, you work at a newfangled company. Maybe it's only existed for five years, and the whole business that it does didn't even exist 10 years ago. You could still be working with data that is older. And the reason I bring this up is I work, I do a lot of work in utilities and like physical infrastructure in the world. And just something as simple as the address of a premise is, um, is important, uh, let me get this, say this straight, was created hundreds of years ago potentially. Those street names, those number addresses might have been created that long ago, and we've still retained them as addresses. The same thing for geological data, location data. There's a good chance that every organization in the world works with data that is much older even than computers let alone than a single application. And during my career, I've seen a lot of people take the fundamental principle that it is an application's job to protect the data. Well, 
certainly application developers have a role to play and have a responsibility to secure data, but that's not the only place we secure data, and we'll be talking about that. The other big reason for this topic is data security is more newsworthy than ever. Every day there's breach notices, there's blaming and shaming about what happened. Um, I know we're getting kind of tired of of all the breach notices, we just say, oh, that's just bound to happen. And I think that's, uh, I'll call it suboptimal thinking about data security. I think everyone should love their data because it's my data too. And then the most important thing is the ROI. And I know you're thinking I'm talking about return on investment, but I'm actually talking about risk of incarceration, the other ROI. I think that you need to uh, encourage management, executives, team leaders, all of these people to understand that governments and other jurisdictions are starting to focus more on all of these data breaches, on ransomware, on all kinds of issues. And even recent privacy laws like GDPR and some work that's happening where I live in Canada is that th these new laws are coming with criminal charges, not just civil penalties or fines, but also criminal charges. Now, of course, if you're hacking into systems and violating laws, you should expect that you're committing a crime. But if you are developing a system and have decided to implement the security phase in version two of your product, there's a good possibility that you, your boss, your boss's boss, or even the CEO or CIO may end up serving criminal penalties for having skipped over or blatantly disregarded the protection of the data. So I make this joke here that ROI stands for risk of incarceration, but this is a huge motivator for architects and developers to take to their bosses when they say, we need more time in the budget, or we shouldn't buy this product because its security is crap and we won't be able to code around it. We need to use that, but there's a risk of incarceration if we go along this path. So loving your data is knowing your data, um, and knowing your data is loving your data. So how can you protect something if you don't know it exists? Like I can remember back to early in my career, I worked on mainframes. There was one system that processed data. Data belonged to a particular application or system. It rarely got moved about. There wasn't streaming data. There wasn't any of these things going on. So it was a lot easier to understand what you needed to protect and all the places that data could yearn to be free and leak out of your system. But these days, data's on your phone, your laptops, in the cloud, on-prem, halfway between the cloud, at the edge, in Internet devices. Um, we need to be able to answer the who, when, where, what, and why of all of our data because we can't protect it if we don't know the answers to those questions. The number one way today of inventorying your data is through some sort of data cataloging program. So there was Azure Data Catalog, which is now Azure Purview that's in preview, which makes it very hard to say. There are all kinds of metadata repositories, system scanners, all of these things exist. And yet the uptake on them can be a hard sell to management because in, on paper it makes it look like you're spending money and it's not going to let you uh, sell more widgets or serve your customers better. That's the way it sounds. But in essence, if you have a catalog of your data and you've classified all of that data, you can now make better decisions on where to focus your security practices, where to focus your data quality efforts, all of those things. But most data cataloging services and products up until now worked on the syntax of your data. And by that, I mean it looked at the names of your tables, the databases, the names you put on columns, the names you put in uh, tags in XML or JSON data items. But we all know, first of all, we as humans get lazy when we're naming things. 
And also, some developers have been tempted to just sock some data away in a particular column that had nothing to do with it. So my favorite example here is that I worked at a retailer where the developers didn't want to ask for a new column to be added to the database, so they just stuck this new data item that was basically how late that customer was willing to wait to be paid or sorry, not customer, vendor, how late they were wait to be paid. Like, could they be paid 30 days later than the contract asked for um, and not make a big ruckus? So the company had been managing their vendors that way, and the developers, instead of asking for a new column, just stuck it in address line four in the address uh, columns for the vendors. And along comes a new um, accounting system and the people who implemented it had no idea that this telltale data was stuck at the end of address line four, and they actually ended up printing it on the checks. So it basically said something like um, pay uh, net 30 plus 30 or net 90 plus 120. And all of their way of optimizing, optimizing their cash flows got printed on the actual checks. That was embarrassing, and that was because there was no data catalog and no data governance. The other item here, data profiling, is important. Because I talked about these uh, data cataloging and inventory systems being based on syntax, is that data profiling looks at the format, the shape, and the values of your data that might be in a column or in a particular data item, and it uses intelligence to try to guess what that actual data is. So the typical tools that I'm seeing a lot of uptake now are in classifying sensitive data. So for instance, if you have a column that's called um, pay, and you're not sure what it is, but it's 16 characters wide, it has only numbers, and the first digit of all the numbers seems like it only contains three, four, fives, and sixes, you could make a pretty good guess that that column is holding credit card data because its profile of that data looks a lot like credit card data. There are other ways of identifying data that look like names, data that looks like email addresses, data that looks like social security numbers or social insurance numbers, all of those things. Once you've done the cataloging and profiling, then you can classify the data. So you put tags on them to say this is personally identifiable information. This is financial. This is uh, employee salaries. This is email addresses. And once you've classified your data, then all the other things we're going to talk about can react to that classification, per perhaps not allowing it to be emailed, not allowing it to be uh, bulk unload downloaded from a table. There's all kinds of things you do once you know your data. And that automated protection is, I think, going to be the next big thing in protecting data. So one of the first principles I said I wanted to talk about was to deploy security measures at the data level first. So what do I mean by that? I mean the closer your protections are to where the data persists, the safer it's going to be. So some examples of some relational database security, these are specific to SQL Server and Azure SQL DB, are properties of a column or a row or a table that you can put right in the database so that every query, no matter where it comes from, whether it's self-service BI, someone pointing an Excel spreadsheet to it, that, those features are invoked every time that data is read or updated, all kinds of things. That means that we're not relying on an application developer to know how a column or a set of columns or how a row can be protected. We can decide based on our business rules, based on the laws, based on compliance, and implement that protection right in the database. That means that the result is we don't have gaps or overlaps in security across multiple applications, across multiple services that might use or work on the data, and that modern databases do this really well. 
One of the great things about working with a relational database, and yes, I'm biased because I've spent my whole career doing that, even though I also work with NoSQL databases, is that the relational databases have been around so long that they've matured to the level where you can invoke these features in just a few minutes, and then it works everywhere the data is touched. So some examples. End-to-end -end encryption. We've had encryption of data on storage for a long time. We've had encryption inside databases for a long time. But where that went wrong was that um, data as it moved out of a database into an integration point and then to a client application, it ended up being unencrypted, re-encrypted all along the ways. And many data breaches that are based on a man-in-the-middle attack were able to get to the data um, while it was, for a short period of time, not encrypted yet. In fact, the big target data breach was a vulnerability that happened in the credit card readers attached to the point of sale, and they were able to get at the data in memory because it hadn't been encrypted yet. But with end-to-end -end encryption, from the database to the end viewing of the data, it's the same encryption all the way through. Another example is data masking. Data masking, especially in the Microsoft world, is not masking as it persists, but masking the data as it's presented. So potentially substituting characters in an email address, just exposing the first letter of the username, the first level of the domain, and .com, or only showing the last four digits of a credit card number. All of those types of data masking help protect the data um, from what I call inadvertent exposure, like someone leaving reports on the printer or someone peeking over a bank personnel's uh, terminal while they're looking up a record. Row-level security in SQL Server is just that. We used to have to implement this using views, using specific application code. This is, for example, that restricts viewing all the rows in the table and only permits viewing of certain rows depending on the role the user is playing. So the typical example that's used is someone in a hospital should only be able to see the rows in a table or the customers that they're directly working with and not just go, um, what a, what, there's a cute name for it, but basically just looking through the database to see if there's any celebrities or looking up information about your neighbor when you don't have rights to it. And then there's all the data access enforcement that you, we used to have to do in applications that now have a way of doing it in the same ecosystem. So role-based access controls is one example. Um, Active Directory is another example to where you know, people don't have a million uh, login names and passwords that they self-manage. Instead, our security systems are better integrated to protecting the data no matter where it is in our system. So access and authorizations. Um, What's really changed, and I hinted at this at the beginning, in how we think about securing our data is that we've gone from what was primarily network-only enforcement. So we would protect our networks, as we should. We'd have these great firewalls that wouldn't allow an outsider to get access into our systems. But then our security, we felt that we had this great firewall and it was going to keep us safe. So inside the systems, we didn't have as much um, security. And what's changed now is you know, now we're computing everywhere, on a plane, in a Starbucks, um, at home now for a lot of us. We're bringing our own devices. We're not just using company-issued devices that are secured by the company. We have many types of accounts and people. We have business-to-business -business people that we want to grant access to some parts of our data. We have people who are contractors and staff that we've always had, but maybe they're not getting one of our login accounts. Maybe we want to have a B2B type uh, trust relationship with that person. We also have gone from just protecting the network to protecting every resource. 
directly. And that whole concept of this change in thinking of locations, devices, people, and protecting resources is part of the zero trust way of thinking about securing your data. And NIST has a really good publication, and because it's from a government body, it means it's free for anyone to view and download and read. And just one of the example diagrams here on this logical architecture for zero trust helps walk you through the fact that you have users who are accessing something and then the restrictions assume that even though someone can log in, they still have no rights to see anything. So that's the zero in zero trust is, um, you know, we, uh, uh, an author that I really like to quote is Jerry Weinberg, and he said, trust everyone, but always cut the deck. So trust people because most people are good people, but design your systems as if everyone is a bad actor. Don't trust a device. Don't trust a network. Enforce your authorizations at the resource level, but through an integrated system. So the biggest change to how we think about security has been the moving towards a zero trust framework for implementing all of your security and protection um, resources. Another one that's really one of my favorites is tamper proofing. So we've built all these uh, zero trust systems. We've uh, we have integrated authorizations and controls. We do more role-based than individual stuff. We have single sign-on. We have inventoried our data. We have restricted access based on its sensitivity. But one of the concepts of protecting your data is making sure that unauthorized changes to it aren't happening. So in the past, the way we did that is first, we, only, we, we took steps to make sure that people couldn't get to data that they weren't supposed to get to. But you can't like lock a clerk out whose whole job is to update the customer records. You can't lock them out of the customer record system, and you can't stop them from making updates because that's their job. But how do we know that someone who is compensated, say, based on how many customers they serve or how long they spend on an open ticket or how fast they can transport fresh produce from one part of the country to the other, how do we know that these incentives and metrics and measures haven't also incentivized them to make the data look better for them or perhaps to redirect money to the wrong location and then doing what's happened at a lot of companies over the years because they're a sysadmin, they can go up and clean up after they've done it. They can delete logs, they can delete login events, they can accidentally corrupt a log, they can do all kinds of things and I bet you every IT professional I've talked with has a story of someone that they once knew who got caught tampering with the data. So the primary way we think about tamper-proofing things these days is with blockchain fundamentals. Now, I almost hesitated to add this because I know there are a lot of people out there who think blockchain is overhyped, that it is overpromised, that um, it's just a bunch of people who are mining Bitcoin, and yada, yada, yada. Well, so blockchain does have all that. It has a lot of hype. And the hype started because, of course, it, this whole concept of blockchain was developed in order to allow people to submit data about Bitcoin in a way that was both anonymous and uh, immutable, unchangeable, so that there was greater trust that the data in the blockchain had not been tampered with. So parts, the way this works in a full-blown blockchain system is that every transaction, every new piece of data, every update, and if you could see me, I'd be putting air quotes around updates, um, is time-stamped. It's immutable. It's unchangeable. And this doesn't just mean the storage is, is write-only or read-only or anything like that. Um, we'll get into this in a second. But 
it, the way a full-blown blockchain system works is it's a highly distributed system, but no one organization controls all of the places where it's written to. So unlike our on-prem uh, relational databases, it would be if some of the rows were hosted at your organization, some of the rows were hosted at another organization, and some of those same rows were also hosted at you know, 50 more organizations. And of course we're not doing that with internal sensitive data, but for things like IoT sensor readings, things like that, the, the trust in blockchain is based on the fact that the data is stored multiple times and that if anyone were going to tamper with it, not only would they have to get access to all the nodes that are, again, multiply owned by many different people and organizations, they would have to be able to update that data, erase all their tracks, and do it at exactly the same time. That's part of what builds the trust that the data has not been tampered with. The other thing about this data that's stored in a blockchain is that each node or piece of data, each piece of data is chained to the next piece of data with a hash of that data. So if you updated the values, that would change the hash, and now it wouldn't be linked to the next, the, the chain would break. Basically, all the chains hooked together would just crumble away because they'd all be pointing to the wrong thing. And so in order to tamper with it, you'd also have to, in the same instance, change the data, change the hash, hook up everything back to the way it was, and do it at exactly the same time. That could be difficult. And then added to all this is a whole bunch of encryption where um, you'd have to be able to decrypt and re-encrypt with keys that you may or may not have access to. So that's the fundamentals of blockchain. So full-blown blockchain systems can work when this type of trust is needed. But what major relational database system vendors have done is they've created these blockchain tables. So it has some of the, um, the fundamental pieces, but not all of it. So Oracle has implemented a new object in the database called a blockchain table where it doesn't have multiple distributed nodes owned by different people. It's still in your database. You are the organization that controls all of it. This is not so that outside people can trust that it hasn't been changed. This is so inside your database you can trust that this data hasn't been changed. So instead of multiple nodes, we have rows. The rows have data. They have access controls. And each row has some special columns that track the hashes and the chains so that each row points to the next row through a hash of the data. and then the a log of all the actions that happen in these rows is written to another place, a log storage, outside the database, outside the table. So there's two fundamental pieces here, the hashing and the immutability. So not only do these tables, you can't update them, you can't add columns to them, you can't update the data in them. This is append-only type tables. There's a log of everything that happened that is now physically separate, separated from the database. So if you were magically able to mess with the data, mess with the hatch, mess with the timestamps, mess with the encryption, you'd still have to be able to get to that log and make changes to it, which it's locked for making changes as well. So this would be used in cases where it was really important that no rows change and no columns change. And the typical example here would be a financial transaction. Heck, generally accepted accounting principles are all based on the fact that you never update a transaction. Instead, you write an offsetting transaction. So if you have $100 in your bank account, if you deposit $100 and then you deposit 20, you don't update the bank account balance to 120, you just have another row that just keeps incrementing or decrementing those things. So that's what uh, Oracle has developed in blockchain tables. Just recently, Microsoft announced this feature in Azure SQL DB. And since their cloud first deployment, this is in preview, but it's called a ledger table. But it's 
the same sort of bringing blockchain fundamentals to SQL DB. And once it's developed and matured in SQL DB, it will likely move to SQL Server on-prem. But the difference here is Microsoft has both append-only tables, which work a lot like the Oracle ones, but they also have updatable tables. So the updatable has a few extra things besides the ledger. It has a history table that also works in a similar way to that log, but it also has logs that are stored in blob storage um, that are immutable as well. The history table there is so that um, to make it easier to query as the values changed. So it has this concept of uh, a ledger database, database digest, which tell you the status of all the ledger functionality that's been implemented, the tables themselves, and when you create the table, you say whether you want it to be updatable or append only. And updatable here means they, that if someone's account balance is updated, it basically does a, a a logical delete and an insert of the new value. So we're still not going in and updating a column like a cell in a table. We are creating a different a transaction there. So the storage where the audit logs go is immutable. It can't be changed. And then, oh, both blockchain tables in Oracle and ledger tables have this feature called validation or verification. So you can run a function that says, please go check to see if all the rows in my table still are in sync with the audit logs, and it runs that verification and comes back with basically a yes or a no. So I've just scratched the surface of these tamper-proof tables, but I wanted to make sure you were aware of them because it's really important to understand that, that having these features inside a database has the same features of all the other, the same benefits of all the other um, features that I talked about inside the database in that it's a single place where these things are created and it's not individual application developers having to go off and develop these things on their own and learn all the lessons about how they can be compromised. The other thing I, I alluded to when I talked about the fluff about blockchain is most of the hate for it is based on the fact, of course, if the data you put into these tables or into a blockchain is a lie or inaccurate or has very poor quality, the blockchain features are going to happily say, yep, we're all good. So someone with bad intent can say, yeah, I just put multiple thousands of dollars in my account puts that into the blockchain, and the blockchain is going to verify it. It's going to keep people from tampering with it. It all looks good. But instead, this bad actor puts cents inside the system, not multiple hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars. And all you can get out of that is cents. But blockchain isn't going to stop you from putting bad data into the system. All it's going to do is protect that data from tampering or from changes that are hard to detect. So I also said at the beginning that um, recovery is our goal, not backup. So I have a bot that tweets every Thursday that, hey, it's Thursday. Have you tested recovery or restores from your backups? Because we don't actually need backups. What we need is recovery. And I say this facetiously, I just want it to stick in your brain that you might be testing and monitoring your backups. You might even have a dashboard that said, yay, all the backups have worked great. But if you, haven't, if you don't have an ongoing program to test restores or recovering your systems, you just don't know if those backups are worth the time you spent looking at a dashboard. So I remember years and decades ago, about once every year or so, the security team or the operations team would hold a secret failover weekend, and you know they'd fail over a bunch of systems to see if they actually recovered. 
Well, imagine not knowing for a whole year that you can't recover your most important systems. So we've all read in the news about whole retailers that went out of business because they had no backups. Um, and then when something fatal happened to their systems, they were unable to recover and therefore went out of business. There's been more than one of those. So yes, we do actually need backups, but we only need them because we need recovery. So I call this, we need to put recovery thinking into our day-to-day -day lives. And yes, the first step to making sure you can recover your data is to make sure you have uh, backups that follow the 321 format of you know of having it in multiple places having off-site backups of having it in multiple formats um, that's all important having really great tools that are designed to optimize the backup experience is definitely the way to go but backup success does not equate to recovery success so I've read about stories of backup systems that were doing just their great thing only to find out that where the backups were stored had been set to a really low retention period, like 24 hours, and nobody understood that that change meant they, they would only have a day's worth of backups. And if the data was corrupted two weeks ago or a year ago or two days ago, they couldn't recover that data. Or backups that were, um, I worked at a company where the backups were to tape, and the tapes were put in the lobby for the, uh, I think the uh, storage company, the off-site storage company to come pick them up. But what had been happening was people thought the tapes were put in the lobby so that people could take these leftover tapes. And it turns out that a whole chunk of the backups were missing because there was also boxes in the lobby where people could drop off books and drop off things that they were trying to free cycle back. Um, so we found out the hard way that backups weren't making it, all the backup tapes weren't making it into storage. Um, there's all of those types of stories. Um, if you think of any, I'd love if you tweet them at me, at DataCheck, because I love collecting these stories. We also need to think about how unchangeable, immutable the backups are. Um, so one of the ways that ransomware has been so successful is that if your backups are online and your backup agent login ID has been compromised because your whole system is compromised, then the ransomware also goes off and encrypts all of your backups as well. So there's a couple of ways around that is one of the physical ways is to have an air gap between your backup systems and where the backups are stored, so they're physically not connected to your systems. And that's what tapes were good at, was that tapes were stored off-site, usually someplace well protected and also away in case it was a natural disaster that brought your systems down. Um, but increasingly, the way it's being done now is the backups are stored in a way that has protections and also does not allow for any writing or overwriting or updating or encrypting for that sense, because encrypting something is updating it as well. So if your organization is still doing backups, everybody's happy with them, but they're also updatable or stored, still connected, you're a good candidate for being attacked by ransomware. Um, I think it's really important that not only do we test restores to see if they work, but to also time them to see if we can meet the RPO and RTOs of what we've told our business people that we can get them um, you know, back to operations and to a specific, specific restore point. Um, I know that uh, I've worked with systems where people didn't realize that the restores are also bound by physics. Um, you know, there's a lot of optimizing and performance tuning we can do for some things, but we can't code our way outside of physics. Um, and by that I mean the time it takes to move bits from one place to another place. That's why people sometimes build failover systems. 
that are highly available so that if a system's down, we're not moving all that data all the time. Um, we should be testing our restores, and by that I mean in an automated way. Um, there's a great blog article out there by Thomas LaRock that talks about doing statistical sampling to test your restores. There also needs to be some sort of triage with your most, um, you know, the systems and the data that most mitigates the risk of down, downtime for your business operations should also be tested there as well. Um, another part of recovery thinking is that just because a job runs and returns a successful indicator does not necessarily mean that it ran successfully. <laughs> and I have to tell a lot of people this, that just because your dashboard has a green light on it doesn't mean that the data actually got moved, all of it, in the right time and to the right place. So the testing of your recovery systems needs to also go look to see if the values are correct and that they're all there. Um, the volume of your data impacts RPO and, and RTO as well. So a good backup system will do all of the deduping and all that other stuff that we use to compress the data, but even decompressing all that stuff can add to the time. That's why I want you to test your recovery for time as well. The final thought I want to leave to you is that with recovery is that good people can do bad things. We've all run a query where we forgot or got the where clause wrong. We have dealt with people who fall on hard times and decide they can make this one change. Nobody will care. No one will notice. Um, I've worked with staff people that reported they tested backups and recovery but hadn't been. They were just overwhelmed at work. I had an employee that destroyed data and all the backups. Um, that's my own personal story of I need to be testing my own restores, and I'm a very small company. So everything you do around protecting data, you should trust but verify. What Jerry Weinberg said was trust everyone but always cut the deck. But how do we do all this? Well, to get through just these things I've talked about, I talked about the importance of discovering what data is out there and inventorying it. I remember logging into a web server one day and I noticed that the database was a lot bigger than what it had been for years. So I thought maybe some maintenance hadn't happened, that a configuration had changed. And I started poking around and I found that on this web server, a developer had been using our database for our website to also learn and play with new features in SQL Server. So he had built tables. He had restored production data from our customer information system and restored them into there. And he had access to it because it was his job to support our web server. But he was trying to learn on his own and like most developers, he took a backup of production to do development and testing on. He was just developing his own skills. So what we had in a web-based database, which was secured but not tightly secured because it didn't have any personally identifiable information in it or anything that we knew of, but all of a sudden, it had personally identifiable information, it had credit card data, it had financial data, and the way I found it was that I found a table and a column that had been identified as potentially being credit card data. And I thought, oh, I'm so happy I found this system where it was identified as credit card data, but it's not, so now I'm dying to know what this column is. And yeah, it was full of credit card data because someone had decided a production system was a good play area, a good sandbox, and worse yet, it was connected to the web. If we had had formal discovery scanners and inventory on that web server, we would have discovered this long before I just stumbled across it. This allows you to then assess your risks and plan your efforts, budget your time for all of these to remediate risks, and then monitor and audit where you need to do this. 
I really wanted to put a whole section on monitoring and auditing in here. There's just not enough room in this time slot. But this is also an area where things have changed big time in the security arena. Monitoring and auditing, well, not always an exciting thing for everyone. It's exciting now because now we have smart auditing or intelligence auditing where algorithms have been developed and machine learning can be used to detect behaviors that fall outside the norm to alert on massive data exfiltration of data leaking from some place that hadn't previously leaked before. There's all of these things that monitoring and auditing can do, probably a session all on its own. So some 10 thoughts for getting all this right. Modern monitoring and alerting is good for security. You should be using new features as they're added to your databases and data stores because you're bringing protection closer to the data, always a good thing. Always test your restores. Um, I think gone are the day of implementing a bunch of random scripts you downloaded from people's blogs aren't going to be enough to protect your data. We're talking about the types of attacks that happen by foreign state sanctioned actors now. You know, some guy's blogging script probably hasn't taken that into consideration. Even though on-prem and cloud security have very different ways of implementing and some features exist in one place and not in the other, the principles around it, the principles I'm talking about today, still apply no matter where your data is. Inventorying is important to security because you can't protect if you don't know it's there. It's everyone's job but we still need specialists in security. We still need data security professionals as well. Attackers have really changed their methods, and organizations need to do that as well. Bad data can still be protected, but that's not likely what we needed. So while I really want you to have secure data, if you don't care about the data quality, securing it isn't making it that much valuable. And I want you to love your data in your systems because it's my data. It's your customer's data. If you like having customers, you should like protecting their data. And then some bonus tips. Trust everyone, but always cut the deck. There's an asterisk on trust just because I'm playing on the word zero trust because you're really not supposed to trust anyone. But I think this is a nice human comment that people generally you should trust, but you should build systems that don't trust them. Um, you should also think about data breaches that happen due to human, human errors, just not insider bad actors or outsider ones. Um, everyone's going to make a big mistake with a data breach. Everyone. We all are. We should plan for that. Um, and that someone who has made a big mistake is likely to do much better afterwards, so the first result shouldn't be thinking of firing them. Automate all the stuff you can so you can free up tasks for which the human brain is a lot better. If someone is still running manual backups um, just when they get around to it on their to-do list, that's the first thing to automate. Um, even the best people do bad things on purpose, plan for that. Um, know that your data is only as secure as your weakest security practice. And then the one last thing I wanted to put in here is I'm a volunteer with the NASA Space Steps Challenge, which is the world's largest global hackathon. It's coming up in October. I'm a mentor in the program. I'm also uh, help with the judging. And what's really cool about this hackathon, hackathon which is a open to anyone, you can even bring your kids into it, is it's not just coding or hacking. There are art challenges. There are um, challenges that come up with design ideas. Yeah, if you're a coder, let's get coding. I'm not a coder anymore, but I would still probably enter the art one and for sure some of the think about new ways of doing things. And the common thing it has is there are several space agencies around the world, including JAXA, the Japanese Space Agency, the Canadian Space Agency, the French Space Agency, all participating because the one common thing it all has is you must use open data, especially from the space agencies, as part of your project. It's a lot of fun. It's a weekend thing. And this is 100% virtual this year. Hopefully soon we'll get back to on-premises 
in-person ones, but it's a lot of fun. So grab some people and submit your challenge. So that's all I had here. Uh, David, are there questions? Yes, there are, Karen. And thank Excellent. you for that presentation. We have a few minutes to answer questions, so let's get right to them. First one in the Q&A box reads, there's a lot of data in systems. How do we prioritize all this effort? Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's important. So if you've done your inventory and you've done your classification, like I'd treat that like triaging, uh, you know, an emergency room. I'd take the most sensitive data, the most at risk, the most likely to bring, you know, impact the company bottom line and work there. There's that, and then there's also a priority is the overall thinking principle. Like, how do you start implementing zero trust around those systems? That's an architectural overall strategy. You could work on both that strategy and a plan towards getting there, as well as reviewing your most sensitive data, where it's all located. And if you don't have an inventory, that's also a great place to start. But yes, we need to be prioritizing based on sensitivity of the data. Okay, great. Here's the next question. Doesn't implementing database or storage specific security features make it harder to migrate to another product or service? Yeah, I hear that one a lot from vendors, where vendors say, oh, we can't do that because it's specific to that database, and someday we might move to another database provider. And that, that does happen. People do migrate away. But I think these days migrating from one relational database or system to another one, people know it's not just, okay, I'll regenerate the DDL in the database it, using this new syntax. It's actually a full-blown migration program. Um, I think the days of not implementing security features because they're specific to that product are over because it's, no pun intended, indefensible that we're not implementing the security features that are offered to us. Okay. Here's a question about those new blockchain tables you were talking about. It reads, why would we use blockchain tables over a full blockchain implementation? Uh, so yeah, that, that's a good consideration you'd have to do. So let me think about this. So the way I would answer that would be that if you don't need fully transparent data out in the world so that other organizations can verify it freely, like what happens with all the Bitcoins these days, all the cryptocurrency, then you'd probably want to keep all your data in-house and that you're going to implement the auditing of your financial transactions through typical auditing, like third-party auditors, which is what the blockchain kind of provides is decentralized auditing of transactions. Um, the other is, is if the data needs to be trustable, but you're just trying to build trust inside the walls of your organization. So one of the things the full-blown blockchain does is increases the trust that the data hasn't been tampered with outside your walls. So it's kind of a middle ground. We had other features in our databases that, um, that allowed us to audit changes to the data, like there's change data controls, there's audit tables, there's audit logs. We've all had that in the past. But today, we want something in between the full-blown blockchain and our older ways of auditing the data. Okay. Well, it looks like that's all the questions we have time for. So thanks again, Karen, for your excellent presentation and answering those questions. Excellent. Thanks a lot, David.